بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam spent the first three years calling the people after he was revealed to, after he was commissioned as a prophet and as and a messenger of Allah Azza wa Jal. He spent the first three years calling those whom he thought that would be accepting his call, would be accepting his da'wah. And it was done in secrecy because it was not wise to go ahead and announce it to the people when the age of Islam was still at its beginning, when it was still very young. Among those who followed and accepted his message were Abu Bakr, the first man to accept Islam. Of course, Khadija. May Allah be pleased with her, the was the woman. first woman to accept Islam. And the first child was so, Ali, Ali ibn Abi Talib. the cousin yes. of the Prophet والسلام, and the first of those who follow or who, those who were slaves was Zayd ibn Haritha. May Allah be pleased with them all. Sheikh, may I have a question? Please. Uh, regarding those who converted to Islam, um, we know that they were pagans. They used to um, commit crimes, sins, uh, prostrate to idols. What about these actions after Islam? Mm -hmm. That's a very good question. And this is one of the reasons that they have accepted Islam so rapidly. It is a well-known fact in Islam that the minute a person reverts to Islam, all of his previous sins are washed away. Amr ibn al-As, may Allah be pleased with him. He was one of the greatest enemies of Islam. But on the eighth year, approximately, after Hijra. After, uh, of course, after Hijrah, yes. eighth year after Hijrah, after the uh, Battle of Khaybar, and before the Prophet ﷺ conquered Mecca, he came with uh, 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 Khalid ibn al-Walid and with others with from the elite to accept Islam. So the Prophet ﷺ spoke to them about Islam and the usual thing would be al-mubaya'ah and mubaya'ah means to give your allegiance and acceptance to Islam. Uh, to Islam and to say that you accept the Prophet ﷺ. So the Prophet ﷺ stretched his hand to Amr ibn al-As who was Accepting Islam, Amr put his hand, uh, stretched it, then he pulled it away. So the Prophet ﷺ asked him, Amr, why did you do this? What's wrong? He said, well, I will accept Islam, but on one condition. I would like to have a condition. I don't want to accept it as it is. I'd like to have my own condition. And the Prophet knew, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that he wanted to ask that Allah forgives all of his sins. So the Prophet ﷺ smiled and said, Amr, didn't you know that Islam erases whatever was before it? And this is one of the blessings of Allah. If a person was the worst criminal ever, if he committed adultery, if he uh, uh, done harm to people, if he was a crooked person, if his heart was black because of the bad things that he uh, has in in his heart. The minute he accepts Islam, it is immediately erased. And now he is facing Allah Azza wa Jal with a new record, with a white new record ready to be filled with good deeds. And that is why most of the companions accepted Islam on the spot. And some of them, it did not take much to convince because as we know, Islam is a religion of nature. It doesn't call you to do things against your nature. And th this is one of the most appealing things in Islam. For example, 
in some religions, it tells you that if you want to reach the peak in piety, you must not marry. You have to remain unmarried until the day you die. And you must not have sex and you must not enjoy life. Islam says that this is a contradiction to nature. Yeah, this is something nice. that Allah Almighty has built in us. I, so, think, I think no one can do this, Yanni. There, there can be people that may be able to do this, but is this natural? No. Islam is a religion of nature, and that is why there were three of the Prophet ﷺ's companions that were so eager on worshipping Allah Azza wa Jal, to the extent that they went to the Prophet's houses, and they started asking the mother of the believers, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, about his daily routine in worship. So they told them that the Prophet ﷺ prays and does this and does that and he fasts and and they felt that this was very little. It's not enough. It's, it's not enough. We have this urge to worship Allah and we can do more. So one of them stood up and said, well, as for myself, I this is an oath that I pray every single night from sunset until the break of dawn. I will never ever sleep. The second man said, well, as for me, I will fast all of my life. So from the break of dawn until sunset, I will not eat a thing or drink a thing until I die. He will only eat during nighttime. Yes. The third one said, well, in this case, I myself will not marry until I die, which means that he will fight the temptations, the natural temptations yes. of having, having sex, of multiplication. Yes. He, he said that I will fight this and not marry again. The Prophet ﷺ heard about this. And his companions came to him and told him that uh, uh, these three people uh, said this and they will do this and this and this. The Prophet was very angry, alayhi salatu And he went to the masjid, he stood up in front of the Muslims and he praised Allah and he prayed on the Prophet ﷺ and then started to teach them. What is this that I heard about people from my followers not wanting to sleep, not wanting to eat, not wanting to get married. By Allah, I am better than you are, and I know more of Allah than you do, and I am more Allah-fearing than you are. Yes. Yet, I sleep and I pray. I fast and I break my fast. I eat during some days, and I marry women. By Allah, those who want a way different than my way are not from my followers. Okay, Sheikh, you said the Prophet ﷺ started his da'wah secretly. He started to call people in secretly. So, if I am in the same situation, I travel to a non-Muslim country, and I want to start calling people to Islam, shall I do the same as the Prophet ﷺ used to do, or yani, this is not uh, Islamic? Or... We've tackled this in a previous uh, uh, program, and we said that it depends on your situation. Now, the reason behind us studying the seerah is to look, look into the phases that the Prophet ﷺ followed in his lifetime. And we will apply this in accordance to what we face. For example, if I go to Europe or if I go to uh, the West in general, calling people to Islam is not a crime that you will be punished for. Yeah. So it is not acceptable at all to call people in secret. But I, I, I think <clears throat> Danny, the, the religion is complete now. And I have to apply the religion as a complete thing. So I can tell the one who is addicted to uh, alcohol, for example, uh, drinking wine and stuff like that, I can ask him, okay, you have to gradually uh, give up this habit, this, this bad habit. So I have to give him this, the final rule, the final decision. This is haram or yani. This is different completely to our topic. What you're referring to are the things that were obligated, yes. where naskh was there. So at the very beginning, 
Islam said that do not get close to prayer uh, uh, while uh, you are drunk. And before that, it was they were asked, what about uh, intoxicants? So Allah said that there are some benefits and there are some harm. And the harm uh, uh, is more than the benefits. And then the second stage was do not pray while you are in the drinking process. If you're drunk, do not come close to prayer, which means that this limits their time of drinking. And the third and final stage, which obligated all the previous two, was do not come close to intoxicants. Yeah. So this is different because this is obligation. But what we're talking here about phases of da'wah, and this depends entirely on the situation. And I gave an example uh, uh, before, uh, uh, just a, a, as a reminder, if you go to a country where it is a crime to be a Muslim, where it is a crime to recite the Quran, as the case, uh, as it was in uh, 20 or 30 years ago in the Eastern Bloc, in, in, in the Soviet uh, era, yeah. it was a crime punishable by law. And all the Muslims were 70 years and over, uh, uh, those were the only ones that knew Allah Azza wa The youngsters did not know anything except La ilaha illa and vodka. This was the only thing they knew. Mm. And there were underground uh, uh, groups teaching the youngsters the fundamentals of their religion. So here, this is applicable. We can use the secret phase because preaching Islam is a crime in these countries. But if you go to a country where there's no uh, uh, oppression towards Muslims, you can practice your, your religion in public, then you have to practice your religion in public as we don't have anything to hide. Yeah. Do, do you get my point? Yeah, I got it. It is very important for us as Muslims to show the world that we are transparent. We have nothing to hide. We are in the open. We don't have any secret cells or whatever they accuse us of, of having because this is our religion. We're proud of showing it and sharing it with, the, with others. But the only way acceptable for us to hide and conceal our religion and da'wah when there is a threat on our lives or on the, a threat on the spreading of da'wah. This, alhamdulillah, in the majority of the countries all over the world, is, is not practiced. Unfortunately, it might be practiced in some Arab countries where the regimes fear Islam and fear the call for Islam. I have once met a, a, a group of, of, of brothers that cannot study any book of Sunnah unless they're traveling from one city to the other. I'm afraid that we have a break, so do please stay tuned and inshallah we will be right back. So this is an open invitation for everybody to recognize God and enjoy His blessings in this life and His mercy in this life and in the hereafter as well. Allah, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. Each name has a meaning. Each name signifies a nature of Allah the Almighty which no one shares or is compared to Allah in it. Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. As you know, the most active one among the companions in calling the others was Abu Bakr Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him. He tried his best to call those who were among the elite uh, 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 and among the poor ones. He used to spend a lot of his money to buy the slaves and set them free, free such as Bilal and so on. Among those who converted or accepted Islam at the very beginning, uh, very, very early stage, were Uthman bin Affan, um, Sa'd bin Abi Waqqas, Abdurrahman bin Awf, Abu Ubaid Amr bin Jarrah, Talha bin Ubaidillah, Az Zubair bin Al Awam. They all accepted Islam at the very uh, early stage, and they themselves were the base that Islam stood on. 
-hmm. because they were the greatest companions of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. Sheikh, I think it's not an easy task to uh, be a cause for the guidance of any person. It's uh, not an easy task, but remember, it's not your doing. Yes. Now, don't mix up your effort with the guidance of Allah Azza wa Jal. It's the cause. Mm -hmm. It's a cause. Yes. And remember that Noah, may peace and uh, blessing be upon him, spent 950 years calling his people to Islam. The messenger of Allah, Noah. Yet mm -hmm. his son died as a non-Muslim in the flood. When he called him, O son, come and ride with us in, uh, in the ark. And he said, no, I will go to a mountain and I will stay away from water. And he drowned. Mm -hmm. We have to know also that the Prophet Wasallam did his best to call his uncle Abu Talib. And he tried to convince him, just say the word. Say, La ilaha illallah, and I will use it to intercede even at the side of those, Allah. Even with those who and whom he loved. He, he was the one that took care of him. Yet, yes. Allah Azza wa revealed to the Prophet Wasallam that you do not guide those whom you love, but it is Allah that guides, guides whom he wishes. No. So, it is not our effort, though it is a reason, yeah. because you cannot sit back and say, well, I pray to Allah that he guides all the people to Islam. You have to work hard and you have to put all the effort that you can in this mission, as one of the scholars used to say, that da'wah work, calling people to Islam, if you give it part of you, it's not enough. It will only be enough if you give, if you give it all of you, all of your time, all of your effort, then you will find the fruits for your da'wah. As Abu Bakr al-Siddiq did. Exactly as Abu Bakr, Bakr al-Siddiq, may Allah be pleased with him, did. Now, the da'wah was in a secret phase. And the Prophet ﷺ work was so excellent to the extent that we have a number of companions, each saying about himself that I was a quarter of the Islam. I was quarter of Islam. In the sense that there was only Abu Bakr, the Prophet ﷺ, Bilal, and myself. And among them, Abu Dhar al-Ghafari, among them Abdullah al Mas'ud, and, and so many of the companions, they all claim to be either the third of Islam or a quarter of Islam, or one out of seven, which means that the Prophet ﷺ did not di disclose the others to each, uh, to all, so that it would be hidden and secret, so that no one would leak some of the information. Sheikh, at this very early stage of da'wah, and besides being secretly, did the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concentrate or so, focus on something in particular? That's a very good question. We have to know that at this stage, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did not teach the people how to pray, as it was not made obligatory yet. He did not ask people to pay zakat. He did not ask people to perform Hajj. He did not ask people to fast Ramadan. So the only thing that the Prophet ﷺ used to teach his followers was to believe in Allah Azza wa Jal, to know Allah more and more by his blessing, by his attributes. The Prophet ﷺ only taught his companions the concept of hell and heavens. He told them that whoever does well will go to heavens and whoever does bad will go to hell. He taught them that Allah Azza wa was merciful, that He was subhanahu wa ta'ala was kind, that He was powerful. <clears throat> he kept on teaching them the Holy Quran. Whatever Quran was revealed to him, he immediately taught it to them and they, have, they studied it and knew what Allah Azza wa Jal wanted fro from them. You have to imagine the environment where the Prophet ﷺ was preaching his da'wah. Now everyone around them was a potential enemy who was waiting to kill them, to attack them. So they had to keep everything 
in secret, secret, they had to strengthen their faith and belief in Allah. And this is the priority in all forms of da'wah. Yes, this, that's <coughs> why when the Prophet sent yes. Mu'adh ibn Jabal to Yemen, he advised him the first thing to call the people of Yemen to uh, was to, they have to worship none but Allah alone. And then if they accept that, you have to inform them there is a salah and there is zakah. And, of course, yeah. this, this is quite true. You have to go gradually with the people. It is not wise for me as a Muslim to go to someone who is not a practicing Muslim and who may not be praying, practicing uh, 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 pr prayer on time and uh, who has so many bad things in him. It is not Islamic for me to go and tell him, your nails are long, you have to cut them short. Yeah. There are priorities. So the first thing for me to do is to fix his belief in Allah Azza wa Jal by calling him to worship Allah alone, by fixing his misconceptions about Allah and about his uh, 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 predestined uh, predestination destination and yeah. so on. Yeah. By doing this, I am following the footsteps of the Prophet ﷺ. So in these years, the only thing that the Prophet ﷺ did was to teach him the Qur'an, to ask them to worship Allah Azza wa Jal alone, and to prepare them for the following stage. Okay, Sheikh, <coughs> is, is there an uh, order of the priorities of giving da'wah? I mean, the, the five pillars of Islam? Or there is another way or of no, no, your priorities usually are determined by the need. For example, if someone who is not a Muslim and does so many bad things, it would be unwise to tell him do not drink, do not fornicate, and the man is not a Muslim. Yes. So my priority would be to call him to Islam. It th there are always priorities, even with Muslims who do not pray and at the same time who smoke okay what is more serious prayer prayer so i call them to pray and let them smoke while praying no problem yes. because this is more important and far important than <clears throat> yeah. smoking alone so you have to weigh the pros and cons to be able to know what your priorities are the prophet ﷺ was preparing the, his companions and part of his preparation was to tell them to be tolerant, not to be aggressive. Part of his teaching was to, and preparation was to tell them of the things to come to them. Yeah. And this was done by telling them about the tales and stories of those who came before them. For example, he told them, as in Surah Al-Buruj, about the village that converted to Islam and the tyrant re uh, leader uh, 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 dug, dug ditches and yeah. filled it with fire and ordered anyone not uh, who, who embraced Islam and refused to worship him to be thrown in it. So we were told that this is what would happen if you stick to your faith, that you have to be tested. And probably this would end tragically but at the end you are on the winning side yes. <clears throat> so he kept on trying to uh, teach them not to seek anything for themselves to stand for the truth and for the sake of truth not to stand up for themselves he also taught them how to ignore the ignorance ignore them by not going into discussions with them or go down to their level. All of this is one of the prophecies of his, that he is the true messenger of Allah. How is that? <clears throat> the Prophet ﷺ kept on promising them, you will prosper, you will win, you will conquer the whole world. Everybody will follow your message and call. But if you look at the them, situ the situation, the situation that's strange. We yeah. are unable 
to pray in the masjid. Yeah. We are unable to disclose that we are Muslims. And very few also. Ve and and there, there are a, a, hand number, a handful yeah. of people yeah. only. Yeah. Yes. So this tells you that the message of the Prophet ﷺ was authentic and real because he had the trust in Allah Azza wa Jal. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed him that you will prevail. Okay, Sheikh, is there <coughs> any wisdom behind that the poor and the weak people who were the first to follow the Prophet ﷺ? This, as mentioned again previously, uh, uh, when Caesar asked Abu Sufyan, who follows him, the weak uh, and poor or the rich and strong? And he told him the weak and poor. This is the habit of the followers of all messengers, that the weak are the people that usually, the weak and, 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 and poor, that follow the messengers. Why? Because they do not have anything to attach them to the ground. Mm -hmm. The rich and strong have their power, have their positions, have their wealth to hold them down, while the poor have nothing to lose. This is something that they believe, then they're convinced that it is true, so they accept it as it is. I'm afraid that this is all the time we have for today's program. So inshallah, until we meet next time, fi amanillah, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm-hmm.